Herons are large wading birds that are found in most parts of the world. They are known for the S-curve in their necks when they fly, and for their great dignity of bearing at all times. In Europe and Asia, including Japan, where these nesting birds were filmed, the most common of the big dramatic herons is the gray. Blue wings, white body, dark head. In North America, the heron with the blue wings, white body, and dark head is known and loved as the great blue. The little green is often overlooked because of his small stature, but he's the most common heron of all. When he stretches his neck, you know he's part of the family. This is Shima Island in the Pacific, just off the coast of Japan. Its steep cliffs and good supply of tall trees have made it a favorite nesting ground for gray herons for many years. They winter in southern paddy fields, marshes, and tidelands where the living is easy. But at breeding time, they come here, where their treetop nests are relatively safe from predators. It's the same for all birds that migrate. In the winter, they live in places where food is readily obtained. But when they're in the mood to breed, they fly as far as they have to, to find nesting grounds where the young have the best chance of staying alive during their terribly vulnerable first days and weeks of precious life. The very fragility of the twig nest is part of the heron's defense plan. It's clearly not strong enough to support your average tree-climbing egg thief. In a high wind, it's not strong enough to support the nest, either. Some years, the gusty winds of spring here on Shima Island destroy entire generations of gray heron eggs. This year's brood, fortunately, is doing fine. In some bird species, the chicks are born precocial, that means they're out of the nest in a day or two and fending for themselves. Young herons want none of that. They'll stay right here, growing like weeds, waving the cute little tufts on the top of their heads and demanding to be waited on for as much as eight long weeks. And all across the colony, as they've done for the past thousands of years, the long-suffering parents will share the task of waiting on them. Amazingly, for birds of such dignity, the parents will put up with this rude behavior well on into the summer. By pulling at her bill, the teenagers, still unable to fly, are persuading her to go and catch more fish for them. She knows that to get food, she must leave the safety of the island and head for a stretch of coastal tideland some 10 kilometers away. She also knows that as a parent, she has no choice. By late autumn, the hatchlings are fully grown, fully fledged, and have learned how to use their great, beautiful wings. It's time now to prepare for the annual migration, time to make ready to join the flock 
for a voyage that may be several hundred miles long. And on the other side of the world, on the wooded edge of a marsh in southern Ontario, exactly the same thing is happening in the life of a great blue heron. Separated by half a world, they're still close cousins. No matter where they're found, anywhere in the world, birds of the same family and closely related species will respond to similar environments in similar ways. The little green heron, common in almost all countries, is a tree nester, just like his larger relatives. The hatchlings will stay in the nest for several weeks. Then they'll stand about on branches expecting to be fed for several more. Our own blue heron achieves success as a fisherman by exercising patience, sharp eyesight, and lightning speed. These skills serve him well. In every fisherman's life, there are those that get away. But for the green heron, this isn't sport, it's supper. He must keep trying, or starve. His neck is coiled, you'll notice, like that of all herons. It can be extended like a shot. Like all birds that are smart and successful, herons are opportunistic. They'll eat anything from fish to frogs. And though their favorite feeding hour is twilight, they're not above dining any time of the day or night. They will hunt and they will eat whenever the opportunity presents itself. like all herons, has serrations, like tiny inward pointing teeth on the inside of his bill. A fish, once caught in this deadly grip, hasn't got a chance. He'll be juggled, turned head first, and gulped, whole and alive. From there on, the heron's digestive juices take over and finish the job. can be a little confusing for bird watchers to identify. With their necks stretched out, they can look like entirely different birds. But they will always have purplish black crowns, greenish backs, and deep chestnut necks and chests. Normally, they will move slowly and with dignity, unless one is chasing another out of its private territory. The small green heron thrives no matter where he is. He's one of nature's more successful experiments. In fact, the green heron, or at least a small local tribe of them, has achieved an adaptation that is not only exceptional among birds, it is rare among all animals except man. That adaptation is tool using. 
Some animals use sticks or stones to pry for food or to break open shells or eggs. Such clever behavior is not common, but it is known to happen. Here at Suzenji Park on Kyushu, the southernmost of the Japanese islands, lives a small population of green herons, summer visitors. There are green herons in various parts of Japan, and when it comes to that, they're common all over mainland Asia. But these herons are special. They may be the only birds of any sort anywhere in the world to have developed their particular skill. Their style of fishing may indeed make them unique in all of nature. The technique involves a live bug. First he catches it, but he doesn't eat it. Instead, he watches for the right moment and the right place and throws the bug out into the water. He does this repeatedly, patiently. Throws it out, brings it in, throws it out again. The bug is not thrown randomly. He puts it exactly where he wants it and waits his eyes fixed on the water. Suddenly a strike, and it's all over for one fat fish. What this remarkable bird has been doing is casting for fish. He chose his bait, cast it out on the water, waited, and caught a fish. This is tool using of a high and for the heron, supremely satisfying order. He has met a basic need, the need for food, using a technique not before known to his species. Just as much as any human angler trying for trout on a Scottish river or going for salmon in Cape Breton's famous marguerite, the green herons of Suzenji Park have become fly fishermen, experts at casting. They carefully place their bait on the surface of the water and watch for precisely the right moment. Like all fishermen, they require patience, for there are many that get away. But his newfound skill means the odds are now in his favor. Heron's taller cousin, the white egret, continues to stick by the old ways. Like all the larger members of the heron family, the egret has a firmly established ecological niche of its own. His survival skills are built around his size and his extreme acuity of vision. Like the more familiar blue and gray herons, the white egret can see into the water with remarkable clarity, an ability that serves him well.
The little green heron has good eyesight too, but his closeness to the water gives him a much smaller field of vision. It's to overcome this and meet the competition that these particular birds have evolved their special strategy. It's one that involves a deep and abiding belief in the ultimate rewards of fortitude. And infinite patience. Each green heron in Suzenji Park has chosen a favorite fishing spot for himself from which he will drive others away. Successful there, he often tends to go to another preferred place for the actual consumption of the catch. Like park visitors all over the world, the people who flock on a Sunday to Susenji have an irresistible compulsion to feed the animals, including the fish. That what they feed them is white bread is unfortunate for their digestive systems but it seems nevertheless to fatten them up to the satisfaction of the resident herons who continue to thrive on them. Suzenji Park's talented green herons have become a local phenomenon. Their special skill at fishing has made them famous, and so it should. For just as much as a primate using a twig to dig out honey, or an insect pounding dirt with a pebble, this local population of green herons has learned tool using. They've learned how to choose bait, in this instance, a twig, and cast it onto the water where they suspect fish may lurk. And it works. The green herons of this park on the Japanese island of Kyushu have invented what is, in the world of birds, an entirely new and obviously effective method of fishing. They do it by doing something not unknown, but very rare in the natural world. They use tools, twigs, Bugs. Like human anglers, they're willing to try anything. And keep trying. They will cast and cast again. Change location if necessary. And change bait. thing the tool using bird won't do is give up. It may be over dramatizing to call the green herons learning to cast an event comparable to man's first use of a sharpened stone, but no matter how you look at it, it's a fascinating example of evolutionary behavior. The kingfisher, one of the best anglers in the bird world, may find the whole business beneath his dignity or he may be here to learn how it's done. Time will tell. Keep an eye on your neighborhood kingfisher. In ponds and streams, lakes, rivers, and oceans all over the world, there are fish that will provide livings for hundreds of species of birds. Each will do its catching in its own way. None will do it as cleverly as 
the green herons of Suzenji Park. The green heron is not nearly as big or as striking or as dignified as his larger cousins, the gray and the blue and the white. Nor is he as colorful as the kingfisher. But he's ingenious. And in the long view of evolutionary change and survival, what really counts is not appearance, it's skill and ingenuity. <laughs>